Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Manitoba Agriculture and Resource Development Crop Talk webinar series. If you have any questions today during the presentations, please type them into the question section of the GoToWebinar menu, and we will answer them at the end of each presentation. Um, your, this webinar is being recorded, and you will receive a link to the recording. Thank you. Thanks, Laurie. Uh, I'd like to welcome everybody to the May 5th edition of Crop Talk. Um, today, we're going to uh, look at a couple things again. We'll be looking at the uh, at seeding annual forages for green feed, silage, and fall grazing. And we have uh, Sean K back on. He's a uh, livestock and forest specialist for Manitoba Ag. And then after that, we'll be uh, going to our crop, crop scouting panel. And again, we've uh, received a few more questions in this week, so we'll be answering them as we uh, as we go through. Um, before we get into Sean's presentation, though, just a little bit of an update on seeding and where we are and uh, what's happened over the past week. And uh, as you can see, our um, right as of the, the first week of May, we're about 18% complete seeding. A um, little bit uh, down from uh, ahead of last year, but down from our four-year average. And uh, I think uh, we'll have areas that are, are definitely a lot higher than 18%, but then we'll have areas that uh, are waiting for, uh, some areas are still waiting for some of the snow to leave the fields and uh, and for the soil conditions to, to warm up a little bit. So some areas we might even have producers not even starting yet. So uh, Definitely a, a range in, in planting, but uh, I think uh, right now what we are seeing is a lot of the uh, peas and a lot of the cereals going in. And I was talking to a producer the other day and it uh, doesn't take a long time, it seems, uh, anymore to get the crop in, uh, especially if we get a good run. Uh, so uh, some producers are even uh, slowing down and taking a break and, and waiting. Uh, on some of the crops to to put them in, and then uh, on the other hand, you get some producers that are anxious and want to just keep going once they get started. So, uh, wide range of, of things happening out there. Found this uh, pretty interesting because we seem to be talking a lot about dry conditions in in uh, in Manitoba here right now, and uh, uh, this map came out with. Uh, our uh, crop report uh, yesterday, and I, I thought took a look at it and. Uh, uh, when you look at Manitoba in general, we're uh, we're sitting right in for soil moisture conditions right now. We're sitting not not too bad, and uh, this is down to 30 centimeters. So you know a lot of times when we look at uh, soil moistures and uh, when we're seeding, you're looking at that top, you know, two to three inches, and then when we open that up, it dries up fairly fast. So uh, uh, we do have some subsoil moisture, and if you can do your best to conserve uh, your topsoil moisture when you're putting the crop in, uh, you uh, will definitely uh, get the crop off and started. And and I've been in some fields now where we're starting to see uh, some of the early seeded uh, barley and wheat starting to swell up and starting to get some sprouts on it. So uh, we're gonna see some crop breaking uh, soil ground here uh, probably this coming week. So uh, be uh, interested to see how the weather uh, weather treats it. Oops. Um, okay, so uh, with that, I think we'll uh, turn the screen over to uh, Sean and we'll get into seeding, uh, seeding crop for cattle uh, for uh, getting into uh, keeping us uh, through the growing season here and into fall. So uh, Sean, if you want to take over and give us an update on seeding our annuals and green feed and silage. Sure, thanks Lionel. You can see my screen okay? You bet. So I'm gonna to touch on annual forages for green feed silage and fall grazing, as well as a little bit on perennial forages. Well, just uh, you're having trouble moving forward, Sean. Just check, click on the screen that you're going to move the slides forward with, just that one, and then okay. it should work now. There we go. There go. Thanks, Laurie. You're welcome. So when we look at our moisture precipitation for the for the winter period since November 1st, Manitoba is sitting quite dry. Pretty much all of Manitoba is less than 50% normal precip, 
And if we look at southern Manitoba, we're sitting less than 30% and as low as 13% in that southern interlake. Portage is sitting at 17%. So we have some super dry conditions in southern Manitoba right now when it comes to our normal precipitation over the last uh, six, seven months. And this is continuing a trend that we've seen since 2017 when we've seen drier conditions than normal. And a couple dry years in uh, 2019, we saw super high hay prices where it was priced at $100 a bale plus, and that's if you could find it. So today we're gonna discuss some strategies to increase not only our perennial forage production, but how annuals can meet your forage supply needs. The reason why you should consider growing annual forages to meet some of your forage requirements is annual forages are much more moisture efficient compared to our perennial forages. So on the left of this slide, you can see corn silage. It requires just over three inches of moisture to produce one ton of dry matter. When you compare this to alfalfa and timothy on the right side of the slide, they require over six inches, almost seven inches of water to produce one ton of dry matter. So the corn is close to double efficient for producing dry matter compared to the perennial forages. And all of our C4 plants, so that's our corn, our millets, our sorghum, they're all more water efficient and drought tolerant. If we look at barley, it takes almost four inches of water. Oats is almost five. And then uh, pea silage is, is just over five. So all of our annual crops, are more efficient than our perennial forages to produce dry matter with limited moisture. Our perennial forages do good in a wet year, but they don't do, do so good in the dry years, which is what we've been seeing over the last three, four years. So this is a slide showing our perennial forage production on the left in the light blue bars versus our annual forages in the dark blue bars. And this was from 2017 at Manitoba's four crop diversification centers. And you could see our annual forage production overall out yielded our perennial forages. And corn on the right hand side produced over 16,000 pounds of dry matter compared to alfalfa, which still did pretty good in 2017 at uh, just over 8,000. So, but again, our annual forages out yielded our perennial forages in 2017, which was more of an average year and not a dry year like in 2018 and 2019. So, so that's why producers who have been tight for feed supplies should look at growing annuals and both cool season and warm season to maximize their forage production in the upcoming year, which is starting out dry. So this is a graph showing the relative amount of a green feed yield by planting date. And this is information from MASC. So you can see at the top of the graph, if you're seeding early, you have a good expectation for a relative yield above 100%. So early seeding translates into higher yields. And this is true with grain production, but it's true with, uh, with green feeds as well. So Early seeding, you can expect a relative yield in that 120, 130% range. As we get later into the growing season, we get into the middle of the graph, into June, our relative yield drops to that 80%. And then as you get to the end of June and into July, our relative yield, so our potential yield drops significantly and then we're down into that 50, 60% range. So early seeding, and again, in dry years is really important. So annual crops can be used for grazing as well. An annual crop seeded can be grazed about four to six weeks after, after the seeding time. This graph shows you the relative yields over, over the growing season. So our fall seeded winter cereal will produce some grazing in the fall time. And then it produces that really early grazing in the spring. So the earliest grazing out of any of the annuals. You can grow something like barley and oats, seeded now and expect to be grazing it in that early to mid June period. But often that's when we have a lot of perennial forage production, our forages with the long, long days in June 
our maximum perennial forage production is usually in June. So is that when we need our annuals or do we want to graze those annuals a little bit later? So one option is to grow a mix of a winter cereal and a spring cereal. You can cut this for green feed and then that winter cereal will continue growing and could be grazed later in the summer or in the fall. Or if you want to just graze your winter and spring cereal, your winter cereal at least will not head out this year. If it's seeded in this spring, it'll stay vegetative where a spring cereal, if you can't keep it vegetative and goes reproductive and heads out on you, you won't get any regrowth. So another option is including some Italian ryegrass, which gives you good growth through the later summer and into the fall, or including some of the cover crops. Uh, one of the issues with growing too many different crops together, broadleafs and cereals, grasses, is you have very few, if any, herbicide weed control options. So annuals can be used to complement your perennial pastures. And whether that's earlier in the growing season or later in the growing season when we often run out of uh, perennial pasture production. So producers have a lot more options nowadays for chopped silage or for making round bale silage. Uh, the equipment technology has improved and we see more producers putting up their forage requirements as, as silage. Why annuals work very good for, for silage? There's a couple of reasons for that. Is our annual crops, so our barley, our corn, our oats, they have higher water soluble carbohydrates. So their sugar levels are higher than our perennial forages. And that makes these crops easier to ensile. They will ferment a lot quicker than our perennial forages. So there's another benefit to growing our annuals. One, not only are they higher yielding in dry years, but they're easier to make into silage if that's how we wanna harvest them. And as our perennial forages get more mature, they will be more difficult to ensile. And that's why conditions have to be ideal to make good perennial forage silage out of either alfalfa or timothy or orchard or quack or some of those other perennial forages. Another reason why our annual crops make better silage is they have a lower forage buffering capacity. And what that means is the the crops ability to resist change in pH. So alfalfa is high in calcium. It's great as a calcium supplement because the calcium levels are, are quite high, but our perennial forage grasses are higher in calcium too. So what that means is it's harder to ensile those crops because they are resisting a pH drop and we need that pH to drop to properly preserve the crop that we're trying to ensile. Otherwise it takes extra sugars to get that pH to drop and to, to have the ensile process occur. So we're needing extra sugars from a crop that is low in sugar. It just makes that ensiling process more difficult. So two reasons why annuals work good for, for making into silage is the high sugars and the low buffering capacity. So what's the optimal stage of maturity for harvesting our annual crops for green feeder silage. Essentially, we're looking at uh, late milk for oats and then early to soft dough for a lot of our other annual cereal crops. So barley, triticale, wheat, we wanna harvest it for green feeder silage in that early to soft dough stage. And that's when we can maximize our yields and quality. If we're talking millet or sorghum, we're looking at early heading. And then if we're growing a pea cereal mixture, we wanna harvest it at the proper cereal stage. So again, if it's barley, at soft dough stage, if it's oats, late milk. Just wanted to mention a new trial that's taking place this year across the province. So because of dry conditions over the last several years, it's reduced our perennial forage production, and this has increased the need for annual forage production for feed for livestock. So the objective of the program is to test varieties of annual crops for forage yield 
and Faldi at four sites across the province. We're going to test oats, barley, peas, triticale, oat and peas, and barley and pea mixtures, as well as millet and sorghum. So this will take place at Manitoba Sport Diversification Centers, and the trials are co-sponsored with seed companies, Manitoba beef producers, and Manitoba Ag. So just shifting gears a little bit to talk about how we can maximize our perennial forage production or optimize production. There's a few different management strategies that we can adopt, and this works well in dry years as well as in, in normal or wetter years. So one of the ways of, of optimizing our perennial forage production is making sure we have legumes in the mixtures. The legumes will increase our yield, they increase protein, which will increase livestock gain. So we wanna ensure when we're seeding our, our perennial forages this year, we wanna make sure our legumes are inoculated, inoculated properly. Inoculant is a living rhizobia bacteria. We can't store it in direct sunlight. We wanna keep it in cool conditions. If a stand is greater than 50% legume, all the nitri nitrogen can be provided to the grasses from the legume. So we will save in fertilizer costs, which helps keep our greenhouse gas emissions down by not utilizing nitrogen fertilizer. So I like to see 50-50 alfalfa grass blends for hay for beef production. Uh, the grasses, they hold their leaves better. Uh, if, you have, if you have to flip the swats, if you're baling under drier conditions, the leaves on grass just, just stay on the plant better than, than alfalfa, which can get quite stemmy. And then having grass in that blend decreases our, our bloat risk. And when we're growing pasture mixes, uh, we have to be careful with uh, how much alfalfa we have in the blend because of bloat, but you can include other non-bloating legumes such as bird's foot tree foil. So I, so I always recommend to, to try and optimize and maximize the legumes in the blend. And if we can keep it at 50%, we can save on for fertilizer costs. Another management strategy is to renovate those older forage stands. During the dry years, 18 and 19, the older forage stands that were mostly grass really suffered from the dry conditions and their yields were, were hurt the most. If you can keep your alfalfa stands at five years of age and younger, that's when they're most productive. And that's when we will have higher production even in dry years. And so you can see after five years, our, our yields start to drop off. And so producers should consider renovating stands that are more than five years old. And when we look at the forage insurance coverage from MASC, you can get higher coverage for stands that are four years and younger. And that's because they're higher yielding. So as a producer, you want to do everything you can to, to maximize your forage production. And you do not want to be buying feed in dry years because it becomes very expensive and uneconomical if you can even find it. So another management strategy is uh, through grazing management. By rotational grazing your pastures, you can double your forage production. So Rest and recovery is very important and that can increase forage production significantly. Another, another factor is providing fertilizer and by fertilizing your, your forage stands, you can increase production another 75% over the rotational grazing. The rotational grazing and fertilizer can increase production over continuous grazing by three and a half times. So quite significant. Uh, results from uh, from the rotational grazing and then the use of fertilizer. By using fertilizer, your your forages are more moisture efficient, and we maybe don't think of proper fertility enhancing the moisture use efficiency, but it does, as well as increasing uh, overall yields. Now I'm gonna look at some fall grazing options to extend the grazing season, which can help cut down our winter feed costs. So producers use stockpiled grass, grazing of second or third cut hay fields. We see corn grazing, swath grazing, cord stover, and stubble grazing as, as well as others. So I'll talk about each of these in a little bit more detail. 
So stockpiled grass essentially is in a pasture situation. It would have been grazed off at least once during the grazing season and the re that regrowth is used later on, uh, generally after the perennial pastures are done growing, used either in uh, late fall, early winter. Or what a lot of producers are doing are grazing their second or third cut hay fields in the fall. And, and either one can provide one to two months of grazing in that fall period when our perennial pastures are finished for the season. Our second cut, third cut regrowth is very nutritious. We see protein in the mid to high teens and energies in the mid 60s. And this will meet a lactating cow's requirements. So lactating cows can put on condition grazing these hay fields in the fall. It's okay to graze alfalfa after close to a killing frost. I like to see 50-50 grass alfalfa blends. The grass holds the leaves better in the fall time and it holds the feed value better. Once alfalfa gets a frost in the fall, it starts to drop its leaves and the feed value will drop. And alfalfa by itself is a bloat concern at 50-50, that bloat concern risk is reduced. And the cost of grazing the hay fields is essentially a fence around the field. So it's definitely something worth considering. Corn grazing is increasing in popularity. We've seen yields in that 250 to 350 cow grazing days an acre for a 1300 pound cow. Cross fencing is very important to improve utilization using electric fencing. We need to control access to help prevent grain overload and provide three to four days of corn at a time. Because when you turn cows into a new patch of corn, if they're used to corn and the taste of corn, they go after all the cobs. So they eat all the cobs, they trample everything else and eat the cobs first. So that's where by controlling access, giving them only three to four days worth at a time, they can't gorge on cobs for, for a week. We need high yields to justify the cost of corn grazing. Our antibiotic costs are just over that $300 an acre, which with the high yield translates into a cost per cow per day of at 80 cents to $1.50 per day for the corn. We want to supplement with a alfalfa grass hay before moving that improves utilization. The extra protein encourages the cows to eat the stalks better. We get extra calcium from the legume and by filling the cows up before we move them we're helping to minimize grain overload because they physically cannot eat as many cobs. It's critical that you have good weed control and fertility when growing corn. In this picture here you can see the shorter corn beside the shelter belt. The reason why it's shorter is it wasn't sprayed so if if you don't like to spend money on fertilizer or your weed control practices aren't very good, then don't grow corn. Those two are critical for growing corn. These are some results from the Mantua Beef and Forge Initiative where I have an extended grazing project and we've been growing corn there since 2016. Uh, so the corn yields since then in 18, 19, and 20 averaged 5.4 ton of dry matter. And remember 2018, 19 were very dry. And so we still saw some really good corn yields and considerably better than the perennial alfalfa that was growing uh, nearby in the, in the hay crops. That averaged 305 cow grazing days an acre. The average protein was 7.3, so just under what a lactating cow will need. But the energy at 73.4, is more than enough for a lactating cow. So the, so the cow will do quite well grazing corn. Even the mid, middle of winter, there's lots of energy when it's cold. And back to the comparison, our hay crop that year at MBFI in 2019 did just under one ton an acre. And those are fairly young fields that were fertilized versus our corn that year did over six ton an acre. So the corn was seven times more productive than our perennial forage was. Another fall grazing option is the use of corn stover. So this works well if it's dropped in rows, especially if we're grazing it later into the winter when there's snow, the cattle can access the, 
the material a little easier and whatever grain is left behind if it's in rows the cattle can can find it a little a little quicker if we're grazing it later when there's snow i would suggest to cross fence it otherwise if you're grazing it in the earlier in the fall when there's no snow it's you don't need to to cross fence it corn stover averages three to five percent protein so less than what a lactating cow will need or even a dry cow but the energy at low to mid 50s will meet a dry cow's requirements but considerably under a lactating cow so i would suggest corn stover works better for for cows that have already had their calves weaned where standing corn works works well for for either so alfalfa works as a good protein supplement it will give that shot of protein as well as a shot of calcium which all annual crops are naturally lower in calcium so we have to ensure when we're corn grazing or on stover that we're su supplementing a two to one or three to one mineral and often even including some extra calcium So cereal swath grazing is another fall extended grazing option that producers can consider. You want to use electric fencing for controlling access to the swaths. A powerful electric fencer in the wintertime is essential. Uh, snow is a good insulator, so the more snow you have, the more of an insulating factor you have, and it's a little harder to, to control the cattle. So you want to make sure you have a powerful electric fencer. Uh, oats, barley, millet, Triticale can be used for swath grazing. Nitrates are a concern, as in any annual crop and should be tested. Depending on wildlife in the area, it can, it can cause a bit of havoc with swath grazing. If you have high wildlife populations, whether it's deer or elk, it's just uh, you have to be cautious with any types of extended grazing, not just uh, swath grazing. Fall weather, if it's wet, you have to be careful when you graze. Now, we've seen yields in that one and a half to three ton an acre, which will produce about 75 to 150 cow grazing days an acre. So it's important that we maximize our yields and that helps keep our costs down. So at the three ton an acre, we can get 150 cow grazing days. Those costs are, are reasonable versus with the lower yields, uh, we don't get as many grazing days and an annual cost or a cost production for annual crops is, is in around that two two and a quarter just depending on which which crop it is so these were the cattle grazing at mbfi at the end of november 2017 you can see not a lot of snow uh, cattle can graze through about a foot of snow without too much trouble when they're swath grazing. Once they get onto it and know where the swaths are, they'll go up and down the rows and, and clean it up pretty good. Works better on the frozen ground. Like to see swath grazing late fall, early winter before we get too much snow or before we get that crusting of the snow where we get snow drifts. And if that happens, then often you have to drive over the swaths with the tractor just to break that crust and allow the cattle access, allow them to be able to get access to, to the swaths. Caution if you have a wet fall is you can see excessive trampling and feed loss and poor utilization if you're trying to swath graze before freeze up or if you're trying to corn graze. So I would suggest to to plan to, to swath graze, corn graze after freeze up. If it's a dry fall, you can corner swath graze, but you do get a little bit more trampling. Uh, the swaths, the plant material, if, if it is a little wet or dusty, the cattle just don't consume it as good uh, once it gets uh, some dirt on it compared to when it's frozen, there's a lot less waste. So plan B, if it's a wet fall, look at either stockpile grazing or grazing your hay fields. There's just less trampling, there's less, less damage on, on your sod fields. A little bit on stubble grazing. So cereal regrowth after combining can be quite significant depending on the brand of combine. The cereal regrowth is very palatable, very nutritious. Again, you have to watch out for nitrates. But you can get 
few weeks, even a month of, of grazing on, on your stubble. So I would challenge producers who haven't carried out any fall or extended grazing to consider corn stover, second or third cut hay fields, or stubble grazing as they are some of the most economical methods of fall and extended grazing. And essentially the only cost is the fence around the field. Uh, you hear some unique partnerships with uh, livestock producers that are grazing uh, neighboring grain fields that, uh, that belong to uh, a grain farmer. And these are creative. And if you can do this for less than what your winter feed costs, which generally you can, it's definitely an option to, to consider. So just look at some of the costs. This is from 2019 at MBFI. Our stockpiled grazing was the least expensive uh, at a dollar per cow per day. Uh, most of that cost was we used two cents per, per pound of uh, standing dry matter for what was grazed. Corn grazing was our next least expensive. Uh, the corn cost in 19 was only 82 cents. Then with supplementation, some labor, some tractor use came in at $1.63. Uh, then swath grazing was third. Uh, it was a little higher because our yields weren't as good that year. Uh, bale grazing was fourth. The high costs of hay in uh, the drier years drove up the cost of bale grazing, which up until then, and when we had cheaper hay available, was a less expensive form of extended grazing. But these were all still cheaper than our traditional winter feeding, which was 4.23. And so if, even if we can save a dollar or two per cow per day, times 150 days, times 100 cows, we can save ourselves 15 to $30,000 per year by extended grazing. So it's something definitely worth considering. It's economical. And even if you, if you don't extend graze for the 150 days, even if you do it for one month or two months, it still results in significant savings. So fall grazing is an opportunity to reduce manure and disposal costs and cut winter feeding and yardage costs. So just to summarize, you want to graze and rest your pastures. You want to include legumes in your forage mixes. You want to spend time and money and effort to manage your pastures and hay fields for higher production. We want to renovate our hay fields every three to five years using deep rooted perennials. We want to fertilize. Properly managed crop is more water use efficient. So you want to hedge your risk by growing some annual feeds for some annuals for feed, some warm seasons like corn or millet or sorghum, and then some cool seasons like oats, peas, or barley. Confine your livestock as little as possible for better nutrient distribution and utilization, resulting in more forage growth in subsequent years. So keeping the cattle out on the landscape, those nutrients are on, on the fields where the crops can utilize them, where the annuals the perennials can utilize them. And then you want to have some flexibility in your feeding program so that you can use feed grains or alternative feeds when we just don't have enough of our traditional forages for feeding the cattle herd and when they're in short supply. So with that, if there's any questions, I'll turn it back to Lionel. Hey, thanks, uh, thanks, Sean. Uh, there is actually a couple questions here. Uh, the first one, uh, I guess, when you were talking about uh, establishing a forage and you were talking about inoculant, the question was, how long is inoculant good for? Uh, a year? Uh, does it make is it good enough for more than a year or less than a year? Yeah, generally, if it's stored properly, so again, the cool, dry conditions it will last up to a year. So if you have some seed that's carried over, now not all that inoculant uh, will be viable, but uh, there should be enough that's viable. If you can get some new inoculant, I always suggest to re-inoculate the seed. Uh, sometimes it's not easy to, to get new inoculant, but uh, definitely it's worth considering and looking at trying to get because price of inoculant is quite reasonable compared to the cost of the seed. As, and even more so the price of the fertilizer if you don't have good inoculation and good good uh, nitrogen fixation occurring. Okay, and uh, the other question is, um, uh, 
cover crops, uh, how would you um, work cover crops in with your extended grazing and uh, and just uh, feed, I guess, for cattle? Uh, lots of programs out there now with the uh, cover crops. Yeah, so cover crops, like I mentioned, could be seeded with some of your spring, winter cereals. It could be harvested for, for a green feed or a silage, and then that regrowth harvest, harvested or grazed in the in the fall, late summer. Um, you do have to be careful if you have weedy fields because you can't use herbicides in a lot of those mixes. You want to go into fairly clean fields. So cover crops are, are another option to provide that late summer grazing when if it's a dry dry year like 2019 where a lot of our pastures and, and hay fields turn brown in, in August, uh, those cover crops would work well to to graze in that August, September, October period. Okay, good. Thanks, Sean. Uh, will you be able to hang on in case there's some questions through the panel here? Sure, we'll do. Thanks, Lionel. Thanks. Hey, Laurie, if you could uh, turn the screen over to me. Okay, and we'll get into the the panel. Uh, okay, so um, getting a lot of questions this past week on uh, planting of soybeans, and uh, I talked to Dennis Lang a few days in a row there, and I thought it'd be a good uh, excuse time me, Lionel. I can't see your screen yet. Is um, I maybe everyone else can, but I cannot. Can you pass it over to me again, or? It's there. Uh, go up to the sharing, um, the sharing tab at the top of the menu there, and choose show screen. There we go. Got it. Okay, perfect. Sorry about that. No worries. Anyways, uh, uh, like I was saying, that uh, we've been getting a lot of questions about. Uh, this past week about uh, seeding soybeans and I mentioned earlier on that uh, some producers were uh, going like crazy getting the crop in and got to the point where they were down to canola and soybeans and you know, starting to get questions regarding should I be planting soybeans so uh, Dennis uh, this is uh, probably the biggest question I got last week so I was wanting to see if you could uh, give your input. Uh, thanks Lionel. Um... So yeah, I've been getting a few of these questions here, and uh, I guess a couple quick things, I guess, as far as the frost risk goes uh, for late season frost, I think we're we're okay in, in most areas. Uh, there's always that risk of frost by putting the beans in now and, and potentially getting frost by the end of the month, but I think that part's, uh, for the most part, we're okay there. Um, the, the biggest challenge that we have right now is our cold night temperatures. Um, last night, um, the night before, in my area here, we were down to zero and almost minus two. With that being said, um, this uh, chart that uh, my colleague had put together, Terry Bus, is it kind of gives you a pretty good idea where some of the, some of the facts are you need to consider. The moral of the story is look at your operation right now and see where you're at as far as acres uh, to go in yet. If you're only looking at putting a few soybean acres in, I might even wait a little bit yet, maybe wait towards the weekend before you start. Um, but uh, Dennis, to uh, did, uh, do you need us to share your screen? No, no, I'm just talking to what's on the screen right now, so. Okay, yeah. Yeah, so um, the other thing to kind of really talk about is like, I guess right now, the risk that you have is number one, I guess you wanna make sure you're putting good quality seed in the ground. Um, if your seed is, is super dry or the germination is a little lower, I might consider waiting a little bit until the soil temperature warms up a little bit. Like you like to see at least 10 degrees um, before you plant. Uh, if you have good seed quality um, and you're planting into a little cooler soil, definitely use a seed treatment, a fungicide seed treatment that'll help things along. And, um, and, and maybe even plant a little higher, be on a little higher on the plant population side. So be in that 200 to 210,000. Uh, with that being said, you know, you could expect three to four weeks uh, uh, before these things emerge. So if I were uh, if, if, uh, if I were planting soybeans, which probably I will be on the weekend, 
Um, I also look at the forecast for next week as well. And they are calling for some showers towards mid to later part of next week. And then, and so at this point, I would probably say if you're getting in by the weekend, I think you're, you're going to be good to go. There is going to be some risk because these things are going to stay on the ground for a little while. Uh, before they do come up, but uh, we are getting into you know by the end of week by the weekend we're into the eighth uh, and ninth of May. Um, you do have a bit of time, of course, but keep in mind that uh, look at that forecast and if they're calling for showers for a two week period, you don't want to be pushing that late May seeding date either. So there's got to be that balance a little bit. So at the end of the day, I would probably start planting by the weekend, um, and uh, but just assess your own your own area as well if uh, the forecast. So those are some of the things that I look at when I'm trying to make decisions. So, okay, Dennis, uh, you mentioned uh, that the temperature was getting down to you know minus one, minus two in your area. What if it goes down to something like we had this? You know, yesterday was minus eight, minus nine here. Yeah. In that situation, of the, the, like going into the, the ground temperature is never going to get quite that cold. Um, you might have air temperature at minus eight, but the ground temperature shouldn't be that cold anymore. That's kind of, um, so looking at planting, you know, towards the weekend uh, into next week, I think would be uh, a better choice than maybe popping them in today. Um, you know, like get yourself geared up, um, make sure everything else is done, you know, all your cereals are done, peas are done, other crops that aren't as great a risk, get those crops in first and then uh, move on to your soybeans after that. But uh, we are getting into, you know, kind of that mid-May here uh, next week. So um, you don't want to lose that window if the forecast is for wet weather following that. Because what could happen is you could have, you know, a week and a half of wet weather when you're not in, and then all of a sudden you're planting last week of May, which is still okay in most areas. But the further west you go, uh, you don't want to be pushing that limit uh, too far. Okay, thanks, Dennis. Uh, sticking with the cool temperatures, uh, this, this question will be for Kim. Uh, what should I be looking for when I'm spraying under these present conditions? Cool conditions, slow growth, and freezing nights. And I think Kim might have a few slides put together, Lori, so maybe we could pass the screen over to her. Can you guys see my screen yet? You bet. Okay, I'll get going. Yeah, I just have a few slides. Thanks, Lionel, for having me on. Um, just to, uh, oops, it's not working. There we go. Um, yeah, just with the temperatures that we've been getting lately and, you know, guys are spraying, we, we actually haven't had a lot of weed growth yet. Um, it's been dry and it's been cool. So, but having said that, the weeds are coming. So I just thought I'd go over some some basics here. And uh, for you guys, uh, I'll just get my pointer a little bit nicer here. Sorry. Um, pointer. I'll get rid of that. Okay. So just, my slides aren't moving very quickly. So just, and just to go over to some of the basics again, um, Harker um, and O'Donovan, some research out of Alberta showed that the yield effect of one weed emerging a week before the crop is equivalent to that of 100 weeds emerging three weeks after the crop. So obviously our early weed growth is crucial. Um, it's really important to get weeds out of there when we can, if it works, um, and to get them out of there when we can. And we, and we do find our best results work when we've got small weeds. However, if we've got some frost events um, and we've got some, some, some weed death going on because of frost events, um, if there's tissue damage to more than 40% of the leaf area, you really need to have new growth before applying herbicides. And you really need, um, uh, you need uh, depending on the, uh, the, the temperatures, like if we've, once we get into that minus four degrees Celsius, and again, it does depend to how long that frost is there. And I'm going to show you a couple slides right at the end of this. Um, it really depends on the duration of the frost. And we see this too, when we're, we're evaluating our crop stands, if they've had a touch of frost, um, it's the temperature, but it's also the duration of the frost. So normally our annual plants can't stand very much of a, of a frost. Once we get into that minus four, things get pretty dicey, especially if it's for any length of time. Time, our winter annuals and our perennials obviously can take a little bit more of a frost and they've got more root roots to roots to regrow from and they've got more reserves to come back from when you are spraying after a frost warm and sunny is better than cool and cloudy but having said that we spray uh, when we can so we can't always wait for the optimum weather because then we start running out of time um, 
So trying to assess how much frost damage is there on the weeds that we're trying to spray. If they're blackened and they're kind of a water soaked appearance, well then they've definitely been hit by frost. But sometimes you don't you don't always see that. Uh, sometimes they can stay quite green. Um, I've seen this with some in crop spraying as well. The weeds are still quite green looking, but when you actually start touching them and playing with them, uh, they're actually quite crispy. So if the leaves are still pliable, then they haven't been damaged, but sometimes they can still stay green and just be um, quite crispy. And then there's, then, you know, that plant's been damaged. Obviously annual weeds are more susceptible. So take a look at the cotyledons and the growing point. If you've burnt off the cotyledons or, or frozen off the cotyledons, I guess, is a better way to put that. And if the growing point is damaged, uh, those weeds really, you need to wait for them to regrow before you're going to spray them. Um, the perennials and the winter annuals, obviously, then they have reserves to grow from. So, but either way, you want to have, you need to have some good weather in order for uh, the weeds to start growing again for the herbicides to work better. If we have successive cool nights like we've been having, if we have lots of light frost or just lots of cool nights, uh, the weeds might be hardened off and then less affected by hard frost. So we might not actually get those 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 kills that we thought we might have when the temperatures really dip low uh, because the weeds will harden off and kind of get used to it. Having said that though, they do take a while to get growing again and we do want to have actively growing weeds in order to take up the chemistry. So early weed control with lower efficacy is better than no control at all. So if you do have to go in and seed, uh, go in and spray, sorry, wait as long as you can. But you, if you do go in a little early after a frost or after some you know, poor growing conditions, your efficacy or basically how the herbicides work is, is going to be less. Uh, but um, if you don't spray at all, then obviously there's no control. But there still has to be some type of biological activity. If there's no biological activity on those, on those weeds, uh, the herbicides herbicide is just not going to work. Um, so the rules of thumb, if you need a, a systemic herbicides, we need to have temperatures hitting in that eight to even 10 degrees, but minimum eight degrees for at least a couple hours a day for at least a couple days in a row, we have to get some growth going. And our contact herbicides, uh, you really need to be in the double digits for those things to work. They just, they just need uh, a little bit more heat um, on those weeds to get growing. Uh, this is an old slide from Dow, actually from years ago, and they basically had talked about overnight temperatures. Um, if you're hitting down right around that zero degrees, you can spray once the temperatures are five degrees and rising because our plant growth will start resuming, you know, at that five degrees. So you'd like to, you know, you should be waiting probably for early to mid afternoon and, and hopefully you've got a few hours in a row of that five degree temperature and, and higher. Actually, like I said, we'd like to see it um, at eight to 10 degrees for at least a couple of hours during that day. If your frost is hitting in that minus two to minus five degree range, um, you can spray once the temperatures get to that eight degrees, or like I said, I like to see them a little higher if we can, and rising, and you need that for that minimum of two to four hours. And if if you hit minus five degrees or colder, you really should wait for a couple of days, at least one day, but preferably more than that. Um, and you want, you know, and hopefully those are days that you don't have more frost. Um, but again, we uh, we can't change the weather, so we, we spray as best we can. So, and I just thought I'd show you, this is uh, from our website and any of us on the call can help you guys. If you guys want to call us, we can show you where this is on our website, but we have um, a really great network of weather stations. And this is just one of the features. There's many, many things you can look at, but I like looking at this. This is just a snip of part of the data that's available. This was at 7.45 AM this morning, or it gets, this is our daily report from last night. I like seeing this. And if you can see my pointer, this is just the, the first part of this re weather report. Our air Temperature at 745 was just over freezing, um, tells you relative humidity and that type of thing. Um, but I like to look at this graph. This is air temperature and relative humidity. The air temperature is in red. And here is our zero line right in here. And you can see in Deloraine, actually, we were uh, above zero right here until oh, I don't know, maybe four in the morning, maybe five, getting probably four in the morning. And then we had quite a sudden drop and dropped down to about minus three and then back up again to zero by say 7 a.m. type thing. So there was a frost in Deloraine, really not that bad. And the duration was actually quite short. If we look last night at rivers, uh, different story. Um, our zero degree line, our zero is about here. So basically just shortly after midnight, we dropped below zero. We didn't get very cold. We only dipped to maybe around minus two, minus three, but it was cold for quite a number of hours in there. So again, the plants are going to react a little bit differently depending on the duration of the frost, not just that amount. And then if we look my final slide, just to show you St. Rose last night, it got quite a bit colder there. 
Uh, we dip below zero in St. Rose here before midnight. Like that looks like probably about nine o'clock or so even where the weather station was. And we were, you know, dramatically low, as low as minus six right here at probably about four in the morning. Um, and, but by 7.45 in the morning, or sorry, 7.30 is when this one was reported this morning, we were still at minus 2.4. So in St. Rose, they obviously um, had a much um, a deeper frost and for a longer duration. So that would affect all plants differently. Luckily, we don't have hardly any crop up yet. Uh, the stuff that's been seeded is just, you know, really not really coming up quite yet. Uh, there's a little bit up, but not very much. Um, but this definitely is affecting the weeds. So you just have to evaluate every situation differently and uh, and kind of, you know, really watch, watch those weeds and see how they're going to respond and, and see when they're going to start regrowing before those sprays are going to work really well. And that's all I had. Thanks. Okay, thanks, Kim. Uh, Lori, if you could pass the screen back to me. Should be there again, Lionel, if you want to try that sharing. Not sure why we're having a glitch here this morning with yours. Okay, I, yeah. how is that? Yep, you're we're there now. Yep, we just want to wait till it slideshow mode there and hmm. not quite sure why. There we it's go. Going. <laughs> you're good now. <laughs> okay. Okay, so these are the slides that Kim had sent me just in case we were gonna have problems with hers. Uh next question is for Anne uh Kirk, uh looking at uh the cool conditions uh how it's affecting my germination of the seed that's already in the ground. Some of it is starting to swell and some is going to break ground in the next day or so. So uh, any concerns that I should have with that seed that's in the ground already? Uh, I, so the cold temperatures, they won't impress this, impose a stress in the germinating seed by itself. So the seed can sit in the ground. It can start to take on water and start the germination process, but it will just be quite slow in cold temperatures. So we know that, you know, things like spring cereals, it's about four degrees Celsius for germination. And I did look back on the um, uh, soil temperatures, the same website that Kim was showing, one of those bars does show soil temperatures over time. So, you know, in much of Manitoba, we're seeing it range between say two and 10 degrees for soil temperatures. So we're at temperatures where those cereals will start to take on uh, water and start to germinate. Um, but yeah, like I said, it will just be slow. So um, people that planted wheat back in say mid-April are probably wondering how long wheat could survive after germination and before emerging. emerging. So I did see some photos yesterday on Twitter from a researcher in North Dakota, and he had a picture of wheat that was planted 33 days ago, so in early April, that's just emerging uh, yesterday. So that's just a good example of something that, you know, it sat in the ground for a really long time because uh, the temperatures turned quite cool but uh, it is able to, you know, resume germination and come out of the ground. You might just see, um, you know, some patchier emergence and some, um, you know, all the wheat wouldn't be emerging on the same day or you wouldn't expect that to happen. So, and I know a lot of people have peas in the ground and they're starting to plant canola. So it's about five degrees Celsius for peas and canola. And um, I know there is corn being planted as well. So it's the soil temperatures, minimum temperature for germination is about 10 degrees for, for corn. So we should see those spring cereals. They should be starting to come out of the ground now. Um, but yeah, just a little bit slowly than you would hope for. Okay, so basically it's just gonna be, you need to give it time and it'll come up and uh, it's, uh, and once the soil does warm up, things will start coming up faster. Yeah, yeah, the warmer the soil is, the faster it'll pop out of the ground. So, you know, it's ideally you want it to be out of the ground as, as quick as possible so that you have less issues with, say, seedling diseases or uneven emergence. But, um, yeah, there shouldn't be an issue with the seed that's sitting in the ground for a long time. Like these spring cereals um, and peas are fairly cold tolerant, so uh, there isn't too much concern there. Okay, great. Thanks, Anne. Uh, Sean, if you're still on, here's the question that... Uh, 
John Hurd had gotten regarding uh, uh, drought tolerance and and millets. Uh, we're I'm just wondering if you were able to get some information on whether German or Siberian millet may be more, which one may be more drought tolerant. Yeah, so our our millets, our sorghum, our corn, they're all C4s, so they're all going to have better drought tolerance and be more moisture efficient. Both the German and Siberian, they're both foxtail millets, uh, slightly different than our, our proso millet, which are our two most common. There's not going to be a lot of difference between the two. I tried finding some numbers yesterday, and it's difficult to find any differences between those two types of millets. Basically, that's a varietal difference, um, a little bit different uh, locations where they were sourced. So uh, they're both going to be similar. They're, you're probably not going to see really much of a difference in our growing conditions here to to really um, make uh, to matter. So. Okay, good. Thanks for looking that up, Sean. A uh, question for John Gavlowski. Uh, again, going back to the cool and the warm temperatures we had and then the cool temperatures. Now, um, is this going to have an effect on any of the insects we normally would uh, see uh, this time of year or close to this time of year? Um, the fluctuating temperatures, does it affect them at all? Hi, John. I think you're still muted. Okay, try that. You, uh, you, can you hear me now, Lori and you Lionel? Bet. Yep, we're good to okay, go. Awesome. Okay, so uh, yeah, covering the three insects on the screen here, I'll start with the grasshoppers. That's the easy one to answer this for. Uh, grasshoppers this time of year, all our pest species are still in the egg stage. There might be a few species that overwinter as uh, nymphs that are starting to come out, but all the pest species are still eggs. They won't start hatching till late May or into June, cooler temperatures that could be beginning of June. Uh, so these fluctuations we're seeing now will affect grasshoppers very little. Um, the, the uh, I guess, climate thing that we need to really keep an eye on is if we get another really dry year, uh, that could, um, make grasshopper feeding on crops a bit worse. What does happen in these dry years, um, our pest species all will feed on a lot of different things, and except for clearwing, which is a grass specialist. They've got a lot of preferred food plants, but in dry years, you lose a lot of that natural vegetation, that vegetation around the field edges, roadsides that they're feeding on, and then they're into your crops more. So if things stay dry, we do have to watch them, but the fluctuating temperatures of recent um, really won't be impacting them. Flea beetles, in the picture there, you've got a striped flea beetle. Striped flea beetles, the species that comes out earliest, and then usually anywhere from one to four weeks later, we start to see the Crucifer flea beetles. Striped flea beetle is very well adapted for cool uh, springtime conditions. They are an earlier emerging species. So when we get those cooler nights, uh, they'll probably be in cracks in the soil, maybe get underneath a bit of debris, but generally they will uh, come through it fairly good. So I'm not expecting big flea beetle kills because of some of the drops in the evening temperatures. Uh, so we'll anticipate that the flea beetles will probably still be there. And cutworms, there's different species, but the ones that we see out early, once again, are ones that are quite well adapted to these uh, fluctuations in temperatures. So right now, if you're finding any cutworms, it's probably going to be something like dingy that overwinters as a uh, larva. Redbacks would just be starting to hatch out. Uh, so a lot of them might still even be eggs. Uh, but the ones that are out, again, are quite well adapted. Um, evenings where it gets down, minus five, minus 10, they're not gonna be out looking for food. They're probably going to be staying in the soil. The warmer evenings, they'll be out looking for food. But again, don't count on them being killed off by the uh, the, the few colder evenings that we've had. So hopefully that covers those three well. Okay, thanks, John. Yeah, uh, so basically we're not out of the woods with insects just because- uh, No, I don't have any good news for you that uh, no insects because of the cooler evenings. Okay, thanks, John. 
Okay, uh, with that, uh, just a few slides to finish off for today. A reminder again of the uh, field crop protection guides. Uh, we're getting into that time of year where we're going to be needing these books, so definitely uh, look for them at your MASC offices, or if you are having problems getting through there, just call the 1844 number at the bottom, and we'll uh, get in, get them in, get them in your hands. Uh, the Ag Adaptation Specialists for the province, there's the uh, seven of us there. There's our contact information if you have questions or you need uh, some help with some of the things that are going on in your field. Don't be uh, scared to give any one of these people a call. And uh, join us next week, uh, May the 12th, for the next edition of Crop Talk.